Uh, thank you for coming, just to start. Uh, my name is Marcos Almeida. I'm here to talk about what me and my team at Invivo have been working on these last uh, months. So we are building a platform. And the objective of this platform is to integrate different kinds of services and services that can be as different as serverless uh, functions running on public clouds and batch processes written 10 years ago running on-premise. Let me explain how we approach this problem. Uh, just before starting, uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, who we, we are. I think we, you noticed that we are outside, we have a booth here. Uh, I think the best keyword I could use to describe what we do is uh, microservices. Uh, I think you all heard about uh, microservices, I guess. <laughs> and we have uh, a suite of products that we use to uh, help our customers first when they want to develop uh, Microsoft based application. I don't know how to do that. So we have a, a product called Studio that can help them to design this kind of architectures. Uh, we have a product that's called uh, EC2. And the point is you have your uh, back end, you have uh, everything on premise, you have services there, and you need to monitor them, and you need to automate some tasks on them when things go well when things go bad. And then the main topic of this, uh, this talk is uh, the products called uh, Scenario. And the idea is helping our customers to create and to execute Scenario using existing services. Uh, I think I need to tell you who are our customers because it brings us lots of constraints that uh, help us to build the product they want. So we work uh, like a in vivo, the parent company. Uh, we are a service company. We work mostly with the uh, in the finance uh, market. And then you know that these guys, they move slowly. So uh, that idea of uh, move fast and break things, it doesn't work very well with them because uh, in terms of features, you want to be sure that uh, the new shiny thing you're building is the right thing you need to put on production. And in terms of technology, it's the same thing. You have old things that you wrote, that work, and then even if they were written 10 years ago, and they work. You don't want to rewrite them just for the sake of doing that. And what we saw when we work with these people is that we end up with a backend that's very heterogeneous. You have lots of different things in the backend. You have lots of different services that exist, that work, but they are built on top of very different kinds of technologies, kinds of paradigms, and so on. And the point is we need to keep all these things running and working together. Uh, who are the main stakeholders we have interact with? Uh, one, on one side, we have IT people. So I think it's, this room is representative of the kind of people we talk the most. So on one side, you have uh, developers. So developers write to, like to write code and to ship things and use, use the shiny new frameworks and so on. On the other side, you have operation people. So these are people that keep the lights on and make sure you're not going to break anything when you put your new shiny thing on production. And if you break something, we want to know, broke. And then on the other side, you have these business uh, analyst people, people that, these are the guys that know what the system is supposed to do. These are the guys that describe what they sh are supposed to do and in many cases, these are the people that are the users of the system. So it's for them that we create these systems. And then we found this need for integration because 
you have these business people that uh, through the years created all these different systems, these different services, and they want to create new services, they want to do new things, and they want to do it easily. So they don't want to, every time they want to create a new thing, to wait six months, one year, and have all the problems of integration. And then you need to know what's there. Even that is a problem. So to know what was created before, how can we use it, how can we use it without breaking it. Then there's a constraint that's it's important for us, and it, uh, it directs a little bit of how we work, is that we have very commonly what we call these long-running tasks. So in the beginning of uh, this project, we, have, we needed to support tasks, jobs, that run from like hours, days, weeks. And this is a problem in itself. Because when something goes wrong, you don't want to stop everything and restart from the beginning. Because you're going to get late and late and late. So they have this need to be able to, when something goes wrong, I stop what I was doing <laughs> and I just restart what needs to be restarted. You they want to fix things while they're running and then restart them and have them go on. Uh, then we saw this new keyword, and then uh, I think we, we all heard about serverless computing, about functions. I saw it many times in, many, in different presentations here. And we think that it goes in the right direction. I'm going to explain why. It's not a perfect solution, but it goes in the right direction. Just to explain what uh, serverless computing, uh, for those that uh, didn't come yesterday and didn't come <laughs> this morning, but the idea of serverless computing is that you are going to create functions, and functions is, is what we are used to writing programming languages. It's something you give an, an input, it does something, it provides an output. The point, the whole point, of this is that you're usually going to run in some kind of virtualized environment. So we don't know exactly what, where it's running. And this is something that's going to be provisioned on need. So if nobody's calling your function, your function is not going to be running. Uh, why we think it goes in the right direction? First, when you create functions, you have some an environment where you know what was created, and you maybe you know how to call them. So you can reuse things easily. Security, so that's something very important uh, for us. So you want to be able to know that nobody is going to call your function without permission, and that your function is not going to call something without permission. So maybe it's not perfect, but there is a model for that, and that's, that's why it goes in the right direction. And then there's something that's nice and dangerous at the same time, is that when you work with these functions, you have these uh, online editors, you can just, you found a bug, you can just fix your code, uh, press, press save, and then the next time someone calls your code, it's going to call the new version of your function. Uh, we, all know, we all know it's dangerous, but it goes on the right direction. But the problem is that one size does not fit all. So I told you that we have, we have all these different systems that we don't want to rewrite, that you don't want, you don't need to take them and put them in a function. So we can't just do that. We can create functions for new things, but not for the old things. And then we have this constraint that we have tasks that are going to run for very, 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 very long times. And then and that's something you're going to find in all these uh, function-based environments, that if you take a function that runs two weeks, some going, someone's going to tell you that they don't like you. So it's a constraint in these kinds of environments. <coughs> and then the main point is that we still have this problem of how to integrate these new shining things with the things that exist already, and then they're very different. So we still have a problem, even if we adopt uh, functions. Uh, I'm going to take an example application that uh, is just an example of the kind 
of services we find and the kinds of services that we need to integrate, just so you have an idea. Uh, but then I have something simple enough so everybody can understand. Imagine you have one service that takes as input a list of URLs, it downloads them, and then it puts them somewhere. And then you have another service that is able to go somewhere, take a set of images, and then it processes them and it puts them somewhere else. It's very simple, but it's the kind of services we need to integrate. You just imagine that instead of processing images, we have some business specific logic. But how do you integrate things like that? The first thing you need to ask yourself when you need to integrate existing services is, am I going to change the code of my services or am I going to use some external tool to do this job of integrating things? And let's say you took the first decision, I'm going to change the code of my services. So I'm going to say first service, when you finish downloading files, you just call the second one and say, hey, I put my files there, you can start processing them. It works. I think we all saw this kind of integration in real life. And we all see <laughs> where it leads us to is that when you start getting complex sets of services that you need to start, that you need to orchestrate, your code starts to get complicated. And then the code that's orchestrating the second service in the pipeline is in the first service. So you need to take your service that downloads files, you start handling errors in processing images, and then trying to find a solution for that. And I think we all agree it's not a really microservice-based architecture because you start mixing the responsibilities of all these services. You can see that we're going to have a problem eventually. Second kind of choice, you could say, okay, let's do some event-driven architecture. Say, when you finish downloading your files, you just send an event and say, I finished my files, they are there. And then the second service, it knows that when someone finishes downloading images, it puts images in this place, I can start processing them. It's better than the first solution. Okay, you add a new tool in the middle, but the tool is kind of simple. But you still have this problem of dependencies because the service that processes images, now it depends on who is the service that's creating the images. You still have some dependence, you still have some complexity in there, in this integration. Then there are the second kind of approach. You just create a tool and you make sure that this tool is going to do the integration. And we saw this in real life a couple of times. That you can say, you say, I need to download images. I know it takes one hour. I need to process these images. I know it takes one hour. So what can I do? I use a scheduler. So this is an example of Chrome, but uh, there are other tools that are used in this kind of uh, context. And you can say, at five o'clock, you start downloading your images. And then at seven, you start processing them. And you know that, that if there's a problem, you have enough time to to see that's happening and try to fix it somehow. And I think we, we all see what's the problem in this kind of solutions because it's get, it gets very complex with time. You don't know where are the de dependencies. You just know that you're starting things, but you don't know why. And then if something goes wrong, you don't know what you do. The next kind of solution that we saw very frequently too, is, okay, there are lots of developers everywhere. And the first thing a developer thinks about is, there's a problem, I can write code for that. 
So I have two services, I need to integrate them. I can write a new service that's going to integrate them, call the first one, uh, handle the possible errors, then call the second one, and then handle the, the possible problems, and everything's going to be fine. Code can do everything. Uh, this is just an example in the shell script, but just to see that you could uh, write it easily, say, okay, while I know I didn't finish downloading my images, I retry, 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 and then at one moment, when it's done, I can start processing them. It, it works. It works. But the problem is, what, what do you do if something goes wrong? So you, you, you coded some cases, you didn't code all of the cases, of the possible cases. You're going to fight them on the lifetime of your application. You're going to write more and more code. If you don't have just two services, you have 100. This code is going to get more and more complex. And then you have a mix of half solutions in very different places. And then there's something we see, and I spend too much time in my life in this kind of discussions, is that, okay, someone wrote some code, you let's stay, take in the principle that it, it solves the problem, it's perfect, but then it's new code. Where are you going to host this code? I'm going to create a new VM, and I'm going to put it with someone, something else, who's going to look and monitor this code to see if something is going wrong, who's going to fix it when it breaks, who's going to update it. So these are all questions we have all the time with this kind of solutions. And then we saw this kind of solution. That's what that approach we choose for our tool is to say that I have an integration problem, I, ha I have all these error cases we should deal with, so let's try to put all this logic in a separate service, but not a service we're going to write our service, or the, the customer is going to write himself, but a service that's smart enough to handle some kinds of situations, maybe no, not all situations, but with the ca this kind of service, we can also help our customers that want to create new and new services by proposing a language, so a workflow definition language that can be used to describe scenarios. So once you have some scenarios that are coded and work, you can create new ones. And then you can raise the level of abstraction. So you're still doing the same thing that the guy that was coding is doing, but it's in a level higher of abstraction. And then you have this execution giant that takes care of some error situations for you. Uh, we didn't uh, reinvent the wheel. Uh, we didn't uh, reinvent the fire. There are lots of tools that do these kinds of things, and we uh, look at them. And the, the only thing we found is that the problem of these tools, and we saw it when discussing with uh, these business people, is that these tools are for developers only. So, okay, developers can go to the documentation, look at the details of how to write those nasty JSON files to describe scenarios. We are sure it can be done. But what we want is to allow these business analyst people to create scenarios based uh, on existing services. And then the second problem is that integration is still your problem. So most of these tools, they deal with the problem of how to execute things, how to orchestrate services, but not with the problem of how can I take these services and integrate them with the execution platform. And this is a project, this is a development project in itself. So it can take months and months to bring these kinds of tools and integrating the existing services to them. Uh, so that's the context where our product is born, our platform. The idea is that we want, based on this approach, we want to provide to each of these stakeholders a set of simple abstraction. So nobody solves the whole complexity of everything. On the side of the IT people, we provide them one, a place where they can de declare, I am able to do this, this, and this. 
So remember, this is still a problem to say exactly what exists, what can be used, and how. Then we provide this abstraction of a task queue. So when something needs to be done, it's going to be in the queue. You can take it, do it, and then send an update saying, OK, I finish it. There's an error. I did half of it. I just tell what's happening. And then we have some means to describe who has the right to interact with whom. On the business uh, side, we just we hide this first complexity and you just say, OK, there's a catalog of services. We give you an editor. I'm going to show it in some minutes, where you can just take them and build new scenarios and test these scenarios. And you give you this, what we call a cockpit. It's a way so that you can follow, monitor what's happening during the execution of your scenario, but in a, let's say, in a functional way. So you just see what's the state of each task and the inputs and outputs given to each task. And if something goes wrong, you can react to that. I'm going to show how. Uh, how we implemented that? So we have this problem of we provide an execution engine, so the engine deals with the orchestration problem, but it's just one part of the problem. So knowing when you need to call what. Then we have this problem of how to deploy it and how to make sure it's available for people that are only on-premise, that's available for people that are only on public clouds, that's available for people that are in a mix of them. So we propose it. We Give it as a Helm chart that you can install in your Kubernetes. And no matter if you are on-premise or on the cloud, you can have it. And then there's this problem of how the system is going to integrate with the execution engine. So we don't want the customers writing code to integrate with the engine. We do it in the other way around. We have this concept of connectors. So we propose a set of connectors that what do they do? They define an interface. So they allow you to define what you take as input, what you provide in as an output. And then they connect to the actual processing, so to your batch processes, to your REST services, and so on. And then what, why, why they are a nice idea? Because connectors are code, and you can run it wherever you want. So even if you are, you are on on-premise and uh, scenario is not is on a public cloud you can keep your connectors at your home and then you keep them close to your data sources and you don't send them to scenario and then you keep your secrets secret you don't need to know secret information to execute to orchestrate a set of services uh, just to explain like in a IT perspective so just resaying what I just said you, what you see, you see this service. So these are REST APIs. You just say a service where you can say, I, I am able to do this and that. You see a service where you can say, uh, when there's something to do, tell me. And then a service where you say, OK, I, when I give you a job, you can send me statuses on how is it going. On the business side, you just have the ability to create scenarios based on this catalog of services, and the ability to monitor the execution of the scenarios. Uh, and we provide a set of connectors. So if we bring back again to the problem of this, how to integrate serverless functions with this, uh, for example, patch applications, on one side, for serverless, so we have connectors to use uh, to connect to Amazon Lambdas and Azure functions. And then we support this uh, provider that's called OpenFast. I don't know if you heard about that. But when we found it, we think it was very interesting, very promising. What's that? That's an open source uh, serverless function execution environment. So you can take it and you can instantiate it on on-premise or on a cloud. And then you can have this uh, serverless execution engine. You can push your functions and execute them on OpenFast. So 
we see it as a solution for people that want to do serverless computing, but they are still on-premise. We support some standard kinds of APIs, so we have these REST APIs, and we support on-premise services. So in the beginning, I told you we have this product that's called AC2. That's very nice because it can automate lots of things when you have uh, on-premise services. So you can start then, you can execute uh, processes. So it would be nice, and that's why we integrate it, to have these abilities when you create your new scenarios and you have existing services that are on-premise. Uh, and then, the last but not the least, we are talking about integration. And sometimes you need just to take the output of one service and tweak it a little bit to make sure it works with the next service. So we have this connector that connects to nothing. So it just takes input, it runs a little bit of JavaScript code on a sandbox, and then it's supposed to produce the output we're going to pass to the next tasks. I'm going to show examples of these connectors. Uh, just to come back again to the problem of serverless tasks, uh, just to so how, what's the challenge behind writing a connector for serverless? Is that first, you need to define what's in your catalog. And what's in your catalog is a set of functions. So we have, I'm going to show a way to say which functions you're going to deploy to make it made available in which uh, deployment. And we have means to say, this is the input I'm going to send to this function. This is the output I expect from the fun this function. and you have means to make sure it's this communication is typed, so it's a contract, and we can check if the contract is respected or not. And we need to handle errors. When something wrong happens, we need to make sure that at the scenario level, you get this error and you react to that. In terms of architecture, it doesn't change a lot from a standard connector. The main difference is that we have this serverless provider in the middle. So we need to call it to say, give me the list of functions that match this crit criteria. Then we take these functions and we retrieve information about input, output, types. We create the catalog with that. And then when someone wants to execute a function, we just call the provider. And when the provider has the response, it calls us back. Uh, I still have 17 minutes. I think it's enough for just talking and talking and talking. I'm just going to show a little bit of what's cross-component scenario so you have a better idea of how it works. Uh, I'm going to start with the example I just took like uh, 15 minutes ago, the idea of I have two services. One is able to download images, uh, download things. It downloads files. And the other one is able to take things somewhere and process them. Uh, this somewhere here is S3, so we're going to download these files and put them in a S3 bucket, and then we are going to retrieve them from S3 to process them. Uh, let me just show. So for those that never saw functions before, the idea is basically that this is Amazon Lambda. So this is the screenshot that I showed you before, but in Rio. So I'm not going to show the details of the code, but the basically there's a function that's going to be called by Amazon when someone calls your function. Amazon is going to give you the inputs, and you are supposed to provo provo do something useful and then provide some outputs. Uh, what's important here is that we use this system of tags that you find it everywhere to declare that I want to deploy this function in this environment. Uh, deploy is not the right word. I want to make it available in this env environment. So it's going to be in the catalog. And then we use tags to declare that this function is going to produce this, like a list of downloaded files as output. And this function is going to take as input a link to a file with the list of things to download. Uh, here is an example of things you can take as input. So it's a plain text file. You just take it, you parse the lines, and you download each file. And I can just show it running. 
But what we're going to have is just, just that what it produces as output is just, it's like it's the key of the S3 bucket where we're going to find the files inside. So, okay, this is just a function. I want to integrate it with something else. Uh, Cost-component scenario. So there are lots of tools that go on this direction is that you can build some scenarios. So we propose this uh, graphical editor. And the point is that you can create a task. And when you create a task, you can go to your catalog and see what's available. And when you go to, for example, I can look at the Amazon Lambda catalog. I can see the list of all functions that have been tagged to say this is available, you can use it. And you have the versions of the function, so you are sure you use the right version for want what you want to do. And then you can link the inputs of this function to the outputs of other tasks on your scenario. So you can come here and say, for example, that as input, I'm going to take an input of the scenario and send you it. Or as input, I'm going to take the output of another task to send you it. And then you can link different tasks on your scenario. That's nice. Uh, let's show how it works. So you have tasks, you connect them on our orchestration scenario. So we know that we need to do this task and then do the other task. And you defined at the level of the scenarios, you have a set of inputs and a set of outputs. If you start a scenario, so it's going to ask you the values of the inputs. And then it's going to do its thing. I'm going to show the outputs, why they are useful later. Uh, then we provide this thing called cockpit, where you can see the scenarios that are running. And you can see at a functional level. So you, you see what you give to each scenario as input. You can see what it produces as output. You can see the status of each task, if there's an error or not. And then you can see if, if for, for example, let's imagine there was an error and the download images download uh, the wrong things, but it took two weeks to run and you don't want to restart it again. So you have means to redo part of it and you just want the rest of the scenario to go on. So for example, you put the new files that need to be processed somewhere and you want to say, okay, let's just forget about the first part of the scenario. Let me just go on with the rest of it. So we have this idea of allowing the user to say, I take the subset of my scenario and I'm going to run it again. And then I can change, for example, other files, the inputs I give to my task. And then I know that it's going to run from this subset on, from this fixed input on. So I can try to fix something that's fixable. Sometimes you can't do that, but sometimes you can. So the idea here is allowing them to do that. I think this is pretty standard. And I, I think you, you understand what we are doing here. We are just running, orchestrating different services. So just send inputs to one of them and then get the output sent to the other of them. So this is something that you, you can see a lot in other tools. Uh, I just wanted to give you more, a, more, a better idea of what we are aiming to, is to build a more complex scenario to show that OK, we started from this scenario. It works. What if you want to build another scenario that is more complex, but reuse the first one? So what can we provide to our customers as features? So we take this first scenario. So we're still doing, we know we have a scenario that's able to download images, and then it's able to process them and put them somewhere in uh, S3. And then we're going to build a more complex scenario and say, let's take, let's not send it the, uh, the list of images as input. No, we are going to take some third party REST service. So I'm going to call it. So here I just took like a RSS uh, provider, 
but you can understand it's similar to just calling a REST service. I'm going to call it. It's going to give me as output an RSS that contains a list of things that are interesting, that are uh, relevant. And then with this list, I'm going to send it to the scenario I just showed you. It's going to download and process them. Uh, let's show how we, how we can do that. So the idea is that I'm not going to. Sh there are lots of tasks because it does a little bit more than what I just explained to you, but the point is there. So the idea is that I want to call a REST service. I want to provide it some inputs, and then it's going to send to me. Here it's a RSS. It's going to me a send to me a, ra a RSS uh, body. It's a XML file, and then I need to extract from it a list of pictures. How can I do that? So that's where in the case where I just told you that you have an output that almost matches what you want to give as an input to another service. In this case, the other service is the scenario I just built. So the idea is that we are going to write this uh, JavaScript task that just, I'm not going to explain <laughs> the details, but uh, it just takes these XML files. It looks for the features that are described in that, and it transforms it into a list of pictures. It's not a file yet, so you're almost there. Then the next thing we need to do is, the, is we need to upload this file somewhere so that the other scenario can take it as input. So again, we have these uh, tasks that are able to call REST applications, and then we just call uh, an application that's able to store files. So it's not S3, it's a service that we have in our cluster. We just take this list of pictures and we push it as a file in this system. Uh, then it's going to provide us an output. It's not a link. So we just need to write some JavaScript code again to take the output it provides to us and to generate a link that we can send to the scenario we created before. And then we can call the other scenario. And what's interesting here is that we really, it's like when you are programming, you call a function with a set of inputs. And then it's going to provide you a set of outputs. So for example, if you click here, we can see that what we are calling if I don't have an internet problem, but <laughs> we, what we would be able to see is that what we are calling, ah, oh, yes. I don't know why sometimes I have these internet problems, but what we are calling is exactly the other scenario we just created, but we're building a more complex scenario around it. So we provide inputs, and then that's why we define a list of outputs, because I want you want it to say, Hey, I put these process files there in this place. You can take them and use them. OK. We call another scenario, we give it output. And then so just showing that we can do a, li a little bit more than just things that run one after another. I put an example here where we fork. We run the two things in parallel. So on one side, I have this uh, JavaScript code that's basically taking the output of the first scenario and transforming it into a link where you can click and go to S3 and see the files. So maybe it may be useful <laughs> to the user to see what was downloaded. And then just for a small demo effect, I have this, this task that takes this, um, uh, this bucket and it displays it in the cockpit. And then we can notice that I have a different icon here. It's a blue icon. It, this is a function that comes from OpenFast. So in our cluster, we have OpenFast that instanti it is instantiated, and we write this as a function there, just to show that in a single scenario, you, we can orchestrate REST services services that are inside inside of cluster, se services that are outside of our cluster. We can orchestrate open fast functions that are on-premise and 
functions that are on Amazon Lambda. So I'm going to start the scenario. Just to show that we have everything is behind APIs and you can call it and start your scenarios automatically. So we, this, this idea, it was born like three, four days ago. Let's create a Google form. So you can go there, select your RSS feed, click on submit, and it's going to start your scenario and process your images. So here we have a list of uh, feeds. So let's take this one and click on send. So it, it's going to start the scenario. Uh, if we come here in the cockpit, we are going to see that the scenario is running. So it's doing, so it retrieved already the list of uh, the, yes, I have some internet problems. So it retrieved already the RSS and then it's running. <coughs> And now it's downloading the images. So while it's working, I'm just going to advance a little bit with the presentation, and then I'm going to show the final result to you. Uh, I didn't have time to present everything and all the challenges we faced building this product. Uh, there are some things that uh, are very important for us, and uh, maybe I'm going to talk about them in future presentations. So how we validate what's happening in a scenario and when something go wrong. So we have some primitives that I couldn't show here to handle these errors automatically. Obviously you can do that in all situations, but sometimes you can do that. Um, we could show you how we integrate actual uh, on-premise services using AC2 into scenarios. Um, this was the talk I gave last year here. So sometimes you want to have tasks that are more like uh, pipelines, so more like streams. So they have a slightly different behavior. So we support this behavior. And sometimes just calling service is not enough. So we saw very quickly that some people have this, some scenarios have this need of, I need a human being to do part of the work. So how can we integrate them in a scenario? Uh, so I told you we are, we, we have a booth here, so we are going to be here the rest of the day. I'm going to be here tomorrow, so if you want, you can come to talk to us. Uh, the main takeaways of this presentation are that we had a problem. So it was to integrate very different services, on-premise, public cloud. We don't want to write code every time we have a problem. So we came up with this approach of having an execution giant to try to raise the level of abstraction of this problem and then to allow people that are not us or people that are not really developers to start creating these scenarios from what exists and to handle these errors when it's possible. Then, and the main thing that helps us with the problem of part of your services are on-premise, part are not on-premise, how we deal with your secrets, how we deal with your data is connectors. So we try what we can to make sure that you need, don't need to write code to have a connector, and then that secrets don't come through the execution engine. So just to show it, the final result uh, here. Oh, and now it's a different effect. <laughs> we have an error. Let me see if it is started. No, it didn't start it. Uh, okay, okay. So let me just show what is supposed to show. So the idea is that you generate from one side a link. So we can go to S3 and see what was downloaded. And on the other side, in parallel, you ha we had this uh, connector that just posts the image. So you can see that uh, not lying and it is doing some real work. Uh, the only thing I want to show is that you remember that we called a scenario here. So here you can see that we have some kind of stack traces of the scenarios. You can see who is calling who and the uh, exactly where you are in this stack trace. Uh, I think it's enough for this talk. We are still here. Come and talk to us. 
thank you for your attention and uh, see you the next time.